we will be picking back up in Revelation tonight in chapter 14. And I don't want to jinx it, but there's only six verses. So I think we can get this done in a reasonable amount of time. But we're in Revelation chapter 14 in our study through Revelation. If you don't remember what the whole study is called, it's Revelation. The time is near. And hopefully as we've gone through this, um, we can uh, know. I'm just going to mute you, Mom. We know that the time is nearer than even when we started this study a while back. And we're going to look at Revelation 14, verses 14 through 20. And the title of the message is A Sharp Sickle. A Sharp Sickle. Uh, If there had to be a subtitle, it would be Thrust in Your Sickle and Reap. And truthfully, there's two sickles that we're going to look at tonight. But I kind of like using the scripture to be the title. And the scripture didn't say two sickles anywhere. And I felt like a sharp sickle uh, was more poignant. But with that being said, let's get into our usual tradition of headlines. (laughs) So (laughs) these are some of my favorites. So uh, Google launches an inclusive language function. That word inclusive should set your alarm bells off. But think of it as spell check, but for your thoughts and for your words and what you type and your Google documents in your email for what you search in Google. Uh, it's active brainwashing. And from their point of view, I think it makes a, a lot of sense. But from uh, the reality point of view, it's kind of scary. Uh, users who type landlord will see a warning that it may not be inclusive to all readers with the suggestion that they should try property owner or proprietor instead. The word humankind is suggested alternative to uh, the term mankind. Gender-specific terms such as policeman or housewife should also be replaced by police officers at stay-at-home spouse. You know, Ash was opening up a bank account for her, uh, her Etsy business the other day, and uh, stay-at-home spouse was not sufficient for the employment. <laughs> so she just gave her last job. Uh, but it's kind of scary to think about that as you were to just try and type a document. They're going to be thought policing you in that and trying to correct your ill ways. Uh, and this one is kind of sensational, but again, you know, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater on this one, but it's noteworthy, uh, because this is what they are preaching in elite circles. They say the world will run out of food in 27 years. Uh, and as of Sunday, April 24th, this is, you know, an article a few weeks old. They say we had exactly 27 years and 251 days until we run out of, of food. Sociobiologist Edward Wilson, um, I'm sorry, I was making sure we're recording. Explained, you know, this guy knows the future, that we would need two planet Earths to feed the current need, adding there are limits to Earth's capacity to feed humanity. Even if if everyone on the planet agreed to become vegetarian, Mima's ahead of the game, uh, (laughs) the world's farmland could not support the need. The world population will be too big to feed itself. You know, they're telling us to stop eating meat, but now this guy's saying, even if you stop eating meat, just eat veggies, we don't have enough. Uh, by then, there will be almost 10 billion people on the planet. Um, uh, the food demand will be increased by 70% compared to 2017. And they, they say that 10 billion is the absolute maximum. And you, you hear this and you think about all those depopulation uh, things that they've talked about in the past. And uh, it kind of makes sense. But don't you think that God knows this as a believer? Don't you think God knows the limit to earth's production? How many people can be here? Didn't he tell Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply? Didn't he tell the animals to be fruitful and multiply? Didn't he tell Noah? We just read it the other night with the kids. He told them again, he reiterated, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. That that God knows that we're supposed to fill the earth. And I think that, not that we're not doing everything anything wrong, but I think in the same sense that all this crying out that we're not going to have enough food, I think maybe if we f- do things differently than the world is doing it, you know, the world is going to squander what was given to them. But I think God knows that the the earth is capable. I mean, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole, but he designed the earth for no one ever to die. And yet it would never would have been overpopulated. So let's think about that. And here's another one. A former Google CEO uh, revealed how excited he is for you to be ruled by robots. Um, This is Eric Schmidt. He used to be the CEO of Google. Uh, He says a computer program, uh, sorry, this is mixing a quote and mixing the article here, but it says a computer program that can use unprecedented strategies to win a chess match proves that AI can see realities 
humans can't see, according to Schmidt. He explains that human intuition is often wrong, and humans aren't as mathematically precise as we wish we are. For these reasons, a better future consists of submitting ourselves and our society over to machines, because if AI can master chess, why couldn't it master society? Uh, later, he says, eventually there will be knowledge systems that will govern society, which will be perfectly rational. And because they are so rational, they will not be understandable by the average human because they can't explain themselves. So if you still think I'm crazy about equating artificial intelligence, having some role potentially in the events of Revelation with the beast, remember that idol given the power to speak and the mark being able to buy and sell. Imagine some AI out there is given in control and now says, well, there's too many people, so we have too much food, so you're limited to only having... Uh, this child, you can only do this for a job. You can only buy this much this week. You think that these ration uh, ration programs are that far off? I, I can see it. I can see it. it's pretty dystopian. Who knows if it'll ever come to be uh, specifically as they want it to? But we know the Bible is clear that uh, the world will be under the under control of a massive idol. Uh, and this other one, silent weapons for quiet wars. Uh, and this you could probably read later. I have all these links uh, just for time. But basically, someone bought an old copy machine in the 80s, and they found some documents on there that were like government classified. And this one uh, talks about the Harvard Economic Research Project. Um, uh, it was a plan which called for control of the populace, util utilizing manipulation of society via traditional pastimes, the educational system, and political beliefs. Uh, a manual that served as a technical declaration of a domestic war upon humanity. And basically it was just this study, I believe it was by Harvard and several others after World War II, about the implications about how to control a society. And you see the way things are in entertainment these days. Um, it almost seems like it's being carried out by the letter. But I bring these up just because I feel that they are so relevant to what we're reading in Revelation. And we see the world is really truly coming together and ready and waiting. And the only thing that's left to happen, truthfully, is that the rapture would take place is that the Holy Spirit would take us home, remove his influence from earth, and the world is going to be free to do all this crazy stuff without any hindrance. And one more for you. Uh, D.C. public schools command four-year-olds to identify racists in their families. Um, and I want you to understand that when they say racist, they don't mean neo-Nazi skinhead. They mean a white person who doesn't believe in white guilt, doesn't believe that white people are inherently evil, etc., this uh, CRT. They want kids to go home and deal with their parents and change their parents, uh, you know, to think like the government. And again, I've read this probably a million times, but Mark 13, 12 says, uh, Jesus says, now brother will betray brother to death and a father is child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. We see that these things um, are on our doorstep, if not already across the threshold. And Lord, we just pray. We do pray for our nation that, God, you'd bring a revival of repentance, God, by your Holy Spirit, as only you can. Then these last days, as things are polarized and split, uh, God, that you would strengthen your church, that uh, the church who is small and weak would be strong in your word and ready for your return. And God, I pray that that would be us. God, reach those that we work with, those who are caught up in these things. We know truthfully that they're hurting and lost and in a lot of pain, and it's why they turn to these things for answers. But uh, uh, just let them see as only you can. We know you can, God. We know that even a rational argument won't save them, but your spirit will. So we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So just to review Revelation, uh, remember John was on the island of Patmos, the Apostle John. He saw Jesus revealed in glory, and Jesus in turn revealed the future to him and, and to us and anyone who would read it. Uh, we know that it's the end of the world as we know it, and I won't sing that old R.E.M. song. I'll spare you that. We know that it's the Great Tribulation, the worst time that the world will ever see, if you can believe that, is coming upon the world. We know that it's the judgment of the nations and those who follow Satan. This is not judgment intended for the church. This is not judgment intended for believers. This is judgment for those who have, uh, for millennia, rejected Christ outright, not just without knowledge, but with knowledge, uh, a true uh, rebellion. But I also believe knowing kind of the heart of God from the scripture, right, and from the way he works in our own lives, uh, that he really wants the world to repent. And remember that as we read all this, God always wants people to repent. If there's time, and we saw that the people took the mark 
uh, in the last time, uh, and they're worshiping the beast, it's too late for them. But for any stragglers left on earth who haven't succumbed to that deception, he's still trying to reach them. And, and while he does that, part of that is seeing judgment take place on earth on those who would uh, come against him. Uh, last time we saw the lamb with the 144,000, the 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. Uh, remember, we saw uh, his father's name on their foreheads. That These folks were marked. And I think that's in a stark contrast to the mark of those in the tribulation who have taken the mark of the beast. It's clear those who are marked for Satan and those who are marked for the father. That those who would left, be left behind are going to get marked one way or the other. For Satan or for Jesus. Uh, you know, it's good. there's not going to be that, that tender middle ground. And we already see that middle ground going away in our lives. Uh, 2 Corinthians one twenty two says, uh, who has also sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee that it's this guarantee that they're his, that, that uh, they're sealed, but also that we are sealed now. That although we don't have a mark on our foreheads, we have a mark in our hearts, in our lives. And I think it's funny. I wonder, I was, see, I don't know what I was watching, but they had, uh, you know, everyone's got the baseball caps on and everyone, everyone's got like a logo. I've got Montana. I don't like to put other people's logos on. Like they're not paying me to advertise for you. But I love Montana so much, I'm willing to be marked by them on my forehead. You know, I've got a logo on my shirt that, I, you know, it's a comfy shirt, but I don't know that I want to, I'll advertise my own stuff, but not theirs. But I wonder if someone from a thousand years ago were to look at our modern society and see all of us walking around with our name brand clothes, with our favorite sports team on our hat, with our bumper stickers of the things we like, right? You know, the the guy in the Honda with the big sticker that says Honda, like, get it, we, we get it, you drive a Honda. I wonder if they would wonder why we are marked and so willing to mark ourselves and brand ourselves with someone else's branding. And I think it's just, in a sense, not that there's anything wrong wearing the, uh, uh, you know, maybe if you wore a New York Rangers hat, I would disagree with you that that's sin. But, you know, you could wear a hat from a good team and be fine. But my point is, is that our society is, is, is getting close to where we're, you know, we're, we're already branding ourselves up. We're already getting tattooed a mark is not that much farther. And if you put the temperature on people today, you'll see they'll be happy to be identified with, with what they believe in, even if it's a permanent thing, even if they realize that they're giving their soul over to uh, Satan, they're going to sign up left and right for it. Uh, we saw three angels with three messages. The first one shared the eternal gospel. We talked about it was eternal. The second one talked about Babylon being fallen, that city, that world economic system, as we'll see in the next couple of chapters. Uh, but then the third one was wrath for those who have the mark, who worship the beast. And I think it was, you know, telling that it wasn't just the mark, right? Obviously, they have the mark, but that it was really this whole system of taking the mark and worshiping the beast. That you're not going to do one without the other. You're not going to worship the beast without the mark. You're not going to take the mark without worshiping him. That people are fully given over to Satan at this point. And what else can, what else can God do with that, right? What else can God do? Satan's not going to repent. And these people have followed him to the place past repentance. And there's not much left God can do but wrath. Uh, so with that, let's pick up the last half, the second half of chapter 14. And we're going to read verses 14 through 16. 14 through 16. We'll take this in two chunks. Um, so let's look at this first chunk. It says, remember John says, he says, I looked and there was a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like a son of man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Then another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap. The time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust his sickle on the earth, and the earth was harvested. And we'll stop there for right now. We see that there's this white cloud. If we remember, Jesus ascended on the clouds, right? He went up on the clouds. The Bible also tells us that he's coming back on the clouds. And we see him on a white cloud here too. You know, it, I remember being a little kid living in Florida and we were getting ready to move to uh, New Jersey or maybe we were in New Jersey flying back to Florida to, to see my grandparents when they were uh, getting older. Uh, but I remember thinking that, and I think I asked my mom, you know, am I going to see Jesus and the angels when we get up in the air? Are they just on the other side of the clouds? I just had this little kid mind that Jesus and the angels were just on the other side of the clouds. And that if I got up in the plane high enough, I'd be able to see them. And I was so excited to do that. Uh, unfortunately, the plane ride was not that much fun, uh, but it was still fun. Um, I still enjoy flying. But what led the Israelites through the wilderness? If you remember in Exodus, what went before them? It was a cloud by day 
and it was fire by night. I, I would submit that it was fire all the time, but the fire was more visible at night and it was cloudy and smoky in the day. But a cloud went before them. And what separated the Israelites from the Egyptians before the Red Sea? Well, that same cloud moved behind them and guarded them and was their rear guard as they crossed into the Red Sea. It prevented the Egyptians from catching up with them. And at the right time, that cloud moved. The Egyptians pursued them uh, to their doom in the Red Sea, that that cloud uh, was around Israel. We know that the, the Shekinah glory of God was like a cloud above um, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. But we see the Son of Man, Jesus here. Uh, the commentary talks about some people struggling with this, being an angel and then an angel telling Jesus what to do. I don't really see it as an angel telling Jesus what to do. I see it as an angel proclaiming uh, what's going on as Jesus is getting ready to do this, that uh, only the Father knows the time, only know the Father knows the appointed time, and uh, and now it is. And so we see the Son of Man, and that was one of Jesus' favorite names for himself, uh, was the Son of Man. He enjoyed having that part of him that was that was connected to humanity in such an intimate way, right? He does, He's not this absentee landlord or absentee, what's the proper word, property owner? <laughs> no, he is an intimate God, and he loved uh, being uh, related to us in that sense. Uh, but he's wearing a golden crown, and I think this is telling. Um, the, the word is Stephanos, right? It's a crown of victory. It's not necessarily a crown of royalty, maybe, but it's really more a crown that you might win after a battle. Or even in uh, the Greek Olympic days, the crown that they get was the Stephanos. And I think this is, this is telling in another sense, because if we remember back to the beginning of Revelation, what was that rider wearing? Uh, where he had the bow and he came conquering by peace and using his smooth words. He was one of the four riders. Well, he was wearing a Stephanos. He was coming as a false Messiah, claiming that he had won and victory and he's got this crown on him. Uh, whether it's an actual crown or it's just spiritually, that's what it looks like. But again, Satan trying to copy the legitimate and truthful Jesus. And we see that Jesus is coming now and he's wearing that crown. But he has a sharp sickle. Uh, and that word is sharp swift and quick uh you know a sharp knife makes quick work it's nothing worse than trying to cut a tomato with a knife as sharp as a spoon it just smushes that tomato down uh you know i got a, a new mower this year and I, it's i told ash it's a game changer you know i just saw my other mower before we moved and i got this like zero turn one now uh, i got it used on craigslist uh but man does this thing cut it cuts quick it's got so much power like nothing gets in the way uh, I got so brave with it that I went out in the back field and started brush hogging all the brush down with it and turned like a field with bushes into a lawn now. You know, yeah, that, that awesome. just these, I'm sure I'll have to sharpen the blades at some point, but this thing was just, it, it just kept going. It was a sharp sickle. Um, and then I was weed whacking and it's funny cause I didn't even, I didn't even read when I was doing this last week. I didn't read this yet. Um, for our study this week at least. And uh, it talks about, you know, I just remember the people in the old days would use a sickle yeah. and I'm there with uh, the weed whacker. I'm like, man, my back would not be able to take having to do a whole lawn uh, with a sickle. And then the other thought crossed my mind, why don't we just get animals and they'll just eat all this grass. And then, you know, <laughs> what a vanity it is having a green lawn and cutting it. In the old days, they'd be like, what are you doing? Go let your goats, you know, out in the field. But I digress. The point is, is that uh, a sickle can be like we think of, um, that picture of death, that, uh, you know, colloquial society picture of the guy with the hood and the sharp sickle coming to, to reap you for death. Um, uh, but this is actually, uh, this word can also mean a pruning hook or a hooked vine knife. It's something that a vine dresser would have. So it's not this big sickle. It's not a big lawnmower. It's more of like this sharp garden prune, right? And we know in the Bible that Jesus talks about uh, pruning that he's going to prune us, that we can grow more, that he's the vine dresser, he's the gardener, right? Mary saw him in the garden after the resurrection. But he's coming in and he's pruning. You know, I, I believe that the the church is coming up and being pulled up with this, that this is, you know, in a picture of the rapture, this is a picture of the end, this is a picture of those who would follow him being pulled up. Uh, but I think it's also this careful cut, as we'll see, uh, of a vine dresser later. You know, we have these all these parables of the vine dressers as well. Um you know, for cutting grapes. But let's turn to uh, Matthew 13, if you would, with me. Matthew 13, 18 through 30. And you're probably familiar with it. So if you don't feel like turning there, totally cool. But I just want us to look at something real quick. And I don't think we're going to talk about it much. I just want to read it for context. 
Matthew 13, verses 18 through 30. And this is after the parable of the sower. Um, and he's explaining it. And he says, uh, Jesus says, uh, Therefore, listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one who receives seed beside the path. But he who received the seed on rocky ground is he who hears the word and immediately receives with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, eventually he falls away. He also who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word. But the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. And all these things are going to be in max effect on the tribulation, choking out any word that remained. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it and indeed bears fruit. Some produce a hundred, a sixty, and thirty times what was sown. And I read that just to think that, man, God desires a good harvest from us. When he comes back to reap, he's expecting to reap um, a good harvest. But let's go on and look at the parable of the weeds in this next section. And Jesus told them another parable saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept... His enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. But when the shoots had sprung up and produced fruit, the weeds also appeared. So the servants of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Then where did the weeds come from? And the landowner said to them, An enemy did this. And the servants said to him, Will you have us also go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather the weeds, you pull up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather up the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather my wheat into the barn. You know, Jesus says, Let them both grow together until the harvest. At the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them first, but gather the wheat into my barn. That there are right now those who would think they're Christian, those who uh, may look Christian, those who may even be pastors of large churches, those who may be in our own families or our friends or our circles, um, who are not wheat. They are tares. And God is allowing them to be there for a time, one, I believe, to repent. But also, imagine if God did that now and was swift with his justice, right, and tore us out and ripped us up. What would happen to us if we began to see people we had faith in get torn away, right, and pulled away. But so God is allowing it to go to the end, and he's allowing it to go until the harvest. And this time of the harvest, I believe, is near. Again, if you look at everything we've been studying, if you look at the events of the world, and truthfully the spirit that's behind, you know, <laughs> the things that newscasters say, the things that these quote-unquote teachers are saying to children, um, the ideas of these corporations, uh, and really all of society, even just laymen on the street who aren't following the Lord. You just as there's common thread uh, among them. And it's, it's, it's telling, I believe. In Luke 10, uh, Jesus said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. That Jesus wants the world to be reaped for him. He wants those to be reaped up with the sickle and brought into heaven. He wants his wheat in his barn. He wants more wheat for his barn. Uh, and it's not just for his sake, it's for the wheat's sake, so to speak. He wants people to be saved. And that harvest is soon, and, and there's still time for the world to repent. Although it seems like the world's never going to repent, they may still might. There might still be another person or two who would turn to him. And I think even for us, to repent of our lukewarm ways, to be healthier wheat for him to harvest uh to, you know that when the the reapers come they don't go you know there's no question when they look at us one way or the other are you wheat or are you not not that they would right we're sealed with the holy spirit but sincerely uh are we healthy wheat for him and we're going to see here that there's a separation of sickles that there's this first sickle to come and then there's a second sickle about to come that we're going to read of that there's two events again this is really a, a high level view uh, I believe it speaks both to the rapture, but also to the tribulation saints, to the end of this happening. Uh, also, the judgment of the righteous to a reward, right? That those who are righteous are brought to the judgment seat, as we'll see in a few chapters, for reward. But to those who are unrighteous, they're brought to a judgment seat for punishment. Uh, that there's two harvests, there's two judgments, 
uh, but in a sense, it's one uh, giant event. And remember, we talked about even the Bible separating the sheep from the goats, that there's going to be the sheep on one side and the goats on the other, that there's right now everything's kind of all mixed together. We're all melting pot in the world, and there's some people who are believers, some aren't, some who look like believers, and some aren't. Uh, but in this last day, God is going to separate them all out to those who love him and to those who have denied him. And there's not going to be there's not going to be a third line, a third option then. And every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess uh, one way or the other. And just to, to dig into the commentary a little bit, uh, uh, David Gusick's commentary says, For the harvest of the earth is ripe. Uh, he says, This ancient Greek word for ripe has a negative sense. To become dry or withered, it means. Uh, this idea of something that is overripe. You know, you ever leave the bananas out on the counter for too long and all they're good for is banana bread, maybe? Uh, what? And Mima likes, likes them at that point. <laughs> I have like a very narrow sweet spot for bananas, unfortunately. I'm not as, my palate is not as capable. Uh, but this means that God will judge the earth only when it is overripe for judgment, he says. He doesn't rush into judgment. And I, I am with that 100% that God does not, he's not quick to judge. He's slow to anger, right? He's merciful and kind with us. But I have to say, doesn't the earth smell overripe right now? I would say it's beyond overripe. I would say it's, it was overripe 20, 30 years ago and we had a last chance and it's pretty rotten, unfortunately now. Uh, but yet God has not come back yet. So that means that there's still some ripeness left somewhere that he can harvest. And let's go on to verse 17. It says, Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also had a sharp sickle. And yet another angel had authority over fire, came out from the altar. And he cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, uh, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. The angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vintage of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. The winepress was trampled outside of the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 186 miles, it says here. But another angel, you know, this messenger, right? He comes out of the temple in heaven. Again, I think it's interesting that there's this picture of heaven. When we picture of heaven, I kind of picture the whole thing to be a temple. But apparently there is a temple within the bounds of heaven. And I don't think it's wrong to think of all of heaven as a temple in and of itself. It's a dwelling place of God and spiritual. But I think if we think about the way God gave instructions to Moses about the tabernacle and the temple and with Solomon, how there were different courts and different sections, I think it's really... Obviously, it's really just a picture of a heavenly version. It's an earthly copy, an earthly shadow, as the scripture might say, of heavenly realities. Um, uh, but, you know, the high priest might go into the, this, the earthly temple, offer a sacrifice. They would trim the wicks on the candles, right? They would keep the showbread fresh on the table. Uh, prayers and incense would be offered. Both uh, All sorts of different offerings would be offered. Uh, both for praise and worship, but also for forgiveness of sins. We know Zechariah, when he saw an angel uh, announcing him to name his kid John, right? Amy, hey, can you sit down? Or do we do? Uh, that this was after 400 years of silence. That it was silence until, whoop, angel shows up and tells Zechariah that John is coming to prepare the way for the Messiah. We know that when Daniel prayed, an angel was dispatched, uh, that it's kind of a two way street. Our petitions. Go up and God's will is dispensed, comes down. And it's not always exactly what we ask for, is it, right? That sometimes we do ask a miss or sometimes it's delayed because there's a spiritual battle going on like we saw with Daniel. But out of this temple, at the right time, comes an angel and he has a sharp sickle. He has another sharp sickle. The Lord was the one on the cloud and gathered up his saints, this intimate act. But God, in a sense, is not going to be so intimate with those who are destined for eternal hell that they've had their opportunity to receive his intimacy and that time has passed and this angel goes down sort of like the angel of death right through egypt and goes and takes the firstborn this angel goes down and another angel has the power of a fire which i think is interesting uh commands him to go and put out your sickle put out your sharp sickle uh you know the word is sharp right it cuts between bone and marrow soul and spirit it divides between right and wrong even in our own lives 
Uh, but we're about to go into uh, fire season here. I just saw a warning at the local fire department. It's been getting green and lush, but that rain is going to stop and fires are going to start. It's interesting that judgment of God is shown with fire and that this angel has power over fire as well. We know Elijah and the prophets of Baal, fire came. Sodom and Gomorrah, what was it destroyed with? Fire from heaven. Um, in Genesis, God says in Genesis 9, I'm not going to destroy you with a flood, but he never says I'm not going to destroy you with fire, right? Uh, 2 Peter 3 talks about, I love this verse, I probably quote it way too much, but it talks about not the big bang at the beginning, but the big bang at the end when everything is burned up with fervent heat. But these fires of judgment are coming. They're coming. They're set aside. They're reserved for those who have rejected Jesus. And in a sense, we should be more worried about the fire from heaven than the fires from hell. And I, I know I'm kind of splitting hairs in this one because the fires of hell obviously is the culmination of all the fire of heaven, right? It's, it's God's wrath poured out on eternity. But this is what should really scare us is that, you know, a lot of people, we think, oh, it's just hell and uh, I'm gonna, it's going to be a party and I'm going to go there. I'll see you in hell and all this stuff. And people aren't really afraid of it. I think if they start to realize that, no, the fire is judgment coming from heaven. To me, that's scarier. To me, that's what got me to come to faith was reading Revelation and going, this is real. God's showing me that this is real and this is coming, like I said previously, and I wasn't ready. And I think that we need more of that heavenly fire of the Holy Spirit, of his word, of being bold, <laughs> not be Catholic and be bold like the bumper sticker we saw today, right? No, but be bold and full of the Holy Spirit and the word, you know, that's fire. When that People can't compete with that fire. The, the prophets of Baal could not compete with Elijah when God's fire came down. They beat their bodies all day and screamed like the loudest, you know, woke liberal there is today and nothing happened and they couldn't compete with it. And people aren't going to be able to compete with the fire of God's word and the fire of God's spirit in your life. They may spay all things against it. They may call you all sorts of names and do things to you, but there's no competition. There's no defeating the fire that comes from God uh, in your life. It's interesting, there's that old book called The Grapes of Wrath, and I probably should read it because it's a classic, but I looked it up because I have thought of it reading about the grapes of wrath here. Uh, and it's interesting that a lot of it could be considered an allegory, and that made me a little bit more interested in it. So if you've read it, you can feel free to give me the cliff notes later. Um, but Revelation 19 says, and we're going to get to this hopefully in a few weeks, Now out of his mouth, out of Jesus' mouth, goes a sharp sword. With it he should strike the nations. This is, again, one of my favorite verses, probably quoted too much. Well, too bad. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That these two harvesting events, this treading out of winepress, treading of the grapes of wrath, uh, is the tribulation period, I believe, but it's also the final battle. It's also the final split there. And again, uh, I believe these angels are decreeing these things are happening. That there's no turning back anymore. That these things are upon us. They're kind of announcing the second act is starting, so to speak. And that's what's about to be here. Again, I struggle trying to match up our linear time with eternity, which is outside of time and the way these things overlap. Uh, but if you can bear with me, I believe they do. And I believe that uh, it speaks of these events. So again, I think a part of it is happening right now. I think a part it's an overview of everything going on and has been going on in the events of Revelation. But it's also, like I said, it's a declaration of these things which are upon the world, uh, which are commencing. It's interesting that it said here as we get ready to close that uh, they were trampled outside of the city. That they were trampled outside the city. That this was not done within Jerusalem. This was not done within the holy city. That they were trampled outside of it, right? Uh, and remember, where was Jesus crucified? Well, outside of the city gates. One, that it wasn't going to defile the city during Passover, but also that it was assigned to everyone who was on the outside uh, that he was coming. Uh, I believe the word for hell in the Jewish language comes from Gehenna. Forgive me if I'm wrong, or it might be the other one. Uh, but basically, it was the same name as a burning trash heap that they had outside of the city. They were smart enough to burn their trash outside of the city. I don't know if you ever smell burning trash, but it's awful. It's awful. Uh, but again, we see another separation here. Just like the first separation and the, the second sickle, rather, and those two separations there. But they're even separated from the city. The unholy is brought outside to be trampled. The things that deserve wrath are brought outside and not bothering the wedding feast, so to speak. It's all taking place outside. And what did Jesus said? Outside the wedding feast, there's going to be what? Weeping 
and gnashing of teeth. That these people are brought out, they can never get in because they chose it, not because God desired it of them, but because they willed it for their entire life and railed against the Holy Spirit of God and chose themselves, said, this way is better. Well, this is the ultimate end, is destruction and being uh, trampled out. Uh, we're also, like I said, we're looking at the events of Revelation 16 and 19 uh, with the uh, final battle of Armageddon, the armies of earth and the Antichrist come against Jesus. And we know that he's got his saints riding with him. So we're going to be there riding back with him. I can't wait. It's going to, I've dreamed about this for so many years. It's going to be awesome. And we're not even going to do anything. The sword's going to come out of Jesus' mouth. They're all going to get slaughtered as we're going to see. I can't wait to get there. You guys, are, I love it. But uh, Jesus is the one who's going to do the battle. We don't need to cut them down. He is the one who's going to cut them down. We just get to play along and cosplay, so to speak, with our, with our white robes and our swords. But his sword is going to do all the cutting. Uh, but it says uh, 1,600 furlongs in a different translation or 660 feet per furlong or, you know, basically 200 miles. And I thought that this was poignant from the commentary from David Guzik. He says, uh, in ancient times, a battle area extending uh, that many furlongs uh, was beyond all known conflict, right? You had a bunch of guys with horses coming together. They're not going to go for 200 miles. It would take them days to compass the battlefield that big, Right. In the old days, in the Revolutionary War, they would gather in a field. The generals would be up on the hills, and then they'd gather in the field and shoot. You know, there are all these local conflicts. You watch Braveheart or classic movies. They'd gather in this one field and get together. It would not be 200 miles long. That would be – there would no way you could, you could tactically call out 200 miles away without radios and jets and all that. But he goes on and he says, not in modern warfare. Uh, the area covered 1,600 furlongs, 200 miles – specifies that the area within a 200-mile radius from Jerusalem will be gathered at the time of the second coming of Christ, Walvoord, um, that this battle going on is a battle that they couldn't have mustered back in the day. This is a modern battle, and in fact, uh, a, a modern from even our modern time that's yet to come, right? Uh, but this is a big battle. Uh, if we remember, the 20th century was the bloodiest century in all of history. I don't have the numbers, but from what I remember hearing, potentially the 20th century had more deaths in it than every other century combined. I mean, a fact check me on that, but uh, world wars, genocides, let's not even count abortion, but atrocities on people by their own governance for people who think socialism and communism is good. Just look to last century, look to this century, look to Venezuela, North Korea, look to China. It's not good. They killed more of their own people than they ever did in the world wars. They starved them. They put them in camps. They murdered anyone who would not come against them. And to think that that's not going to happen again, just because it's a couple years later, I mean, <laughs> give me a break. It's, of course it's going to happen. And this century is going to be worse. Even if the Lord doesn't come back in this century, it's got to be worse. Man's not on an upward trajectory, no matter what MSNBC will tell you. We're not enlightening ourselves down this path. This is a path of deep and utter darkness. And what did Jesus say? If the light you have is truly darkness, how deep that darkness will be. But this is going to be the bloodiest battle in history. Imagine blood for 200 miles coming up to the, the bridle of a horse. You know, we went and got to see some horses yesterday. We have horses in our neighbor's yard and it was great getting to pet them. And I didn't sneeze. I think the clarity didn't work. So I was getting warmed up to the idea of a horse. Oh, yeah. But I can't imagine being on top of a horse and wading through blood that, that thick and that high. That this is going to be bloody. That there's going to be a lot of people in that wine press of the wrath of God. There's going to be a lot of people hating the Messiah when he comes back and charging to their sudden death. It's not going to be pretty. And then God calls us out, right? God's got a friendly God. He's Jesus. Let the little children come to me. He made the world, you know, rainbows and kumbaya, right? All that's part of the joy of God. But there's this other side where God does not mince words. God does not play around. When it comes to righteousness and unrighteousness, when it comes to his son being sacrificed, his son's blood being poured out all over that cross, all over that Appian Way for those miles up to there, all over that post when his back was shredded up, there's no joke when he comes back. People who have resisted that will bleed, and they will bleed more, and they will bleed out. And not because he doesn't love them, but because unrighteousness has to be dealt with and has to be dealt with seriously. And if we look at our society today where unrighteousness hasn't been dealt with, even if we look at our own lives where we allow unrighteousness to flourish, does it not cause destruction? 
Can a man not bring fire in his lap and not be burned? Can we not play around with these things and expect good things to happen? We can't play around and say, oh, we accept you. We love you. It's okay. It's not a big deal. It's not that we're going to hate people and cut their heads off like the Muslims do. But man, we can't play. We can't say no. We can't go along as a church and say this is okay any longer. Because it's not okay. Because more than that, God says it's not okay. God says some of these things that the world champions, that even some of the church champions, is an abomination. The strongest word possible. It's no joke. God's no joke. We, we take it lightly and too lightly, myself included. But God is serious about sin, and he's serious about righteousness, and he's serious about judgment. You know, rightly so. Unrighteousness is going to be swiftly dealt with, with that sharp sickle, swiftly cut down, swiftly trampled. And God has already been patient enough. And like we've seen that word about being ripe, it's already long past due. You already should have made the banana smoothie. <laughs> and now, you know, it's just because... Whatever reason, you're hanging on to the last minute because God loves God loves the bananas of the world, right? He loves us <laughs> that he's hanging on and he's given us another minute to repent and given us another minute to share the gospel. But Albert Einstein says, as we close here, I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones, he says. I, I think we already kind of had World War III with the war on terror and we're really kind of in World War IV right now. But semantics aside... If we truly go to nuclear war and we go through the things of the tribulation, we go through, you know, just look at like a cold, a glorified cold, ruin the world economy. And I know there's a little bit more there involved in that. But with the events of tribulation, the events of the war, events of the famine, events that are bringing about the Antichrist coming to be, the, the church being raptured, I'm not sure we're going to have the capability to do modern warfare. Perhaps there will be tanks and things going against Jesus as we'll look uh, at some of the, the, the wording potentially later on. But man, we could also be on horses. We could also be on horseback. I, I envision the millennial reign of Jesus on earth and people are back to being an agrarian society, right? We beat our swords into plowshares. But we'll see. We'll see when we ride back with him, right? You know that as these harvests are coming, the harvest is not done yet, right? We're still here. We still have time. God still wants people to come to him. It's not too late even for the most crazy person you could think of, uh, uh, crazier than me, and that they could come to know the Lord. If God was gracious with you and me throughout our lives, God allowed us to come to him when we did, right? There's still a right time for all those who are still breathing. They may hate you when you preach them the gospel, but know again that they can't resist that fire. And the reason why they're and so angry, the reason why they want you to recognize all their weird names for themselves and make no sense is because they feel the heat. They feel that burn coming up. They don't realize what it is potentially. Maybe they do. They've rejected it. So many possibilities. But know that God is not done yet. And while we're here and while we have breath and while the church is here, God desires to use that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, God, we love you. And we thank you that you're patient and you're merciful. And that, God, you don't treat us as our sins deserve. So, God, do forgive us. Do help us be a light and be uh, stand for righteousness. So remember, when people might rail against us or the world comes against us, that we need to love them and, and, and help free them uh, by your word and spirit and uh, our love, uh, God, from the shackles that they're in and preach the gospel in season and out. But God, also help us be strong and not have to go along with the world and not say this lovey-dovey love of the world, but be strong and say, no, this is wrong and, and judgment is coming for it. But God loves you and there's a way out and you can be forgiven and it, it doesn't matter. Uh, God, so we love you and we ask you for these things. Uh, bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name, yeah. a, amen. So may God bless you and keep you and his face shine upon you. There is a vineyard of the Lord. There is a vineyard for our soul. With all our troubles left behind the door, we drink first light until